sincere gratitude to Dr. Jyoti Dev for his kindness so that uh, I am here in your midst in this present evening. The session, have we been able to unravel the KGA1C paradox in type 2 diabetes? Fairly new topic. Now, uh, Dr. Anand Nigam is the speaker. And, uh, there are certain very interesting points. Uh, I am sure he will be throwing more light on this. The first point is um, overweight and obese patients with coronary heart disease undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention had a better outcome compared with their normal weight counterparts. That is the first statement. This is the phenomenon called obesity paradox. Now the second statement is amputation risk decreased in diabetic men with increased BMI. The third statement, in T2DM, patients T2DM with cardiovascular morbidity, obese individuals had lower mortality than their normal weight counterparts. So, some of the statements very interesting and uh, I request Dr. Anand Nigam from Jaipur to throw more light on these subjects because points. Thanks uh, Jyoti and Sonita for inviting me to a very interesting uh, topic that uh, I've titled have we been unable have we been able to unravel the kg a1c paradox now people could be thinking what is it we all know that when you advance therapies in type 2 diabetes you increase weight you want the hba once to go down but the a1c goes down but your weight goes up and as smart physicians and with advancement of knowledge we need to really understand do we really understand this problem? And if we do, can we do something about it? Number one. Number two, we need to also understand that not all therapies are relevant for all people. So that's again something that I want to say. And these are my disclosures. I work with a lot of companies. And as we talk, we sit amidst a whole bunch of epidemics of type two diabetes, pre-diabetes, cardiovascular disease and obesity. And you can see here for yourself that the number of people with diabetes are, as you know, are largest in this part of the world. But the number of people with obesity also are much more in the developing world than the developed world. So that's a cause of worry for all of us. The numbers are increasing by the day and that's something that we need to understand. We have several clinical current challenges in the management of type 2 diabetes and several of them are unmet needs. I've enumerated a lot of those needs there which include multiple pathophysiologic abnormalities trying to prevent beta cell apoptosis, durability of therapy is big issue, tackling obesity and managing weight and weight gain and hypoglycemia as you intensify therapy is a big challenge and that's going to be the focus of my talk this evening and of course preventing complications managing cardiovascular therapies and cost of therapies all are something that we need to really keep in mind now we also need to i'm what i'm trying to show is are two cases here obesity and increased weight in people with type 2 diabetes now here is a person who's a 43 year old female who's just been diagnosed with diabetes, less than one month. And look at her body mass index, it's 31.4, 68 kg weight, 
she's got a family history of diabetes and she's got obesity. So this is one person, her concerns are uncontrolled diabetes and weight. So this is patient A. Now let's talk about patient B. Here is somebody who got diabetes about five years back, has a body mass index of 25.9, he's 54, he's a university professor, uncontrolled diabetes, current medications include metformin, glimepiride, and pioglitazone. Again, the concerns are uncontrolled diabetes, but what is concerning him is that he's gained about four kilograms plus in the last five years or four years of therapy that he's had. So you've got two people, one who entered with obesity and diabetes and the other who gained weight during therapy for diabetes. Now, as you see the natural history of obesity, on the left shows you the primary weight gain that you get or people with obesity who get into diabetes. And can you prevent that? Yes, you can by lifestyle intervention and other things. And here is a group who initially loses weight when he gets diabetes and then he gains weight because of diabetes therapy and this is where we are worried about. So it's really concerning that presence of obesity increases the risk of diabetes. Then as you intensify diabetes or glycemic control, your weight goes up. And do these diabetes medications really push the weight up? Can we do something about it? And that's the big challenge. Now diabetes, obesity really is a cause of many problems. And you can see here the number of problems that you get with obesity. About 75% of people with diabetes or type 2 diabetes are obese. And this is data from India. And if you see Asian Indians, you can find here obesity and you can see here diabetes and you can see here the complications that it has. Atherogenic dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, hypertension and diabetes. And look at what Elliot P. Jocelyn was able to predict in 1923. With an excess of fat, diabetes begins and from an excess of fat, diabetics die. That was 1923, Elliot P. Jocelyn. Now, as body mass increases, your risk of diabetes increases. And these are two cover pages of India today. The, the one on the right is 2004. And you can see here, this was published in the Time magazine, not India Today. And they said, the two phases of India, poverty and obesity. And then in 2006, India Today gave this title, the girth of a nation. So we were increasing in our girth. And this is data from our center we are seeing if you see the red bars are all people obese, almost 30 to 40% people. And you can see here large waist circumferences. The blue bars are body mass indices between 23 and 24.9. So we are in the midst of a fat tsunami. Now it's not really only the body mass index. It's really where the ectopic fat lies. And here are two gentlemen, some of you who know him and some of you don't. This is Professor Yagnik from Pune and this is John Yutkin from UK. They have, the, they have an identical body mass, you see, 23. And if you see his body fat, Chitranjan Yagnik's body fat is 21% and he has only 9%. For the same body mass index, he's got much more visceral adiposity, he's got ectopic fat and abdominal adiposity. And these adipokines that are released from this visceral fat have a lot of pro-inflammatory and uh, factors and the anti-inflammatory factors are low. And this fat, visceral fat is really the dangerous fat as we call it. Now what is, now I come to what really is this KG1 paradox, KG A1C paradox. Now this is the peril of reducing HbA1c when you start using sulfonylurea, when you start using meglinotides, insulin and glitazone. It doesn't mean that you can't use these agents. It means you have to use them carefully. You have to combine them with proper agents and see that you don't really upset the KGA1C paradox. As, as I mentioned, you try and push the A1C down, your weight is going up. And this is therapy of type 2 diabetes. But it just doesn't stop there. As you try and intensify therapy, hypoglycemia increases that increases defensive snacking. Your patients will come and tell you that they tried and eat something between this. Please don't photograph that. I'm sorry, don't disturb it. 
as you see here, this defensive stacking increases weight. And this is data from type 1 diabetes. And similarly, similar things are happening in type 2 diabetes. Your weight is going up. So hypoglycemia and weight gain are intertwined. They will occur together. When you get this collateral weight, this damage, the weight gain, it increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and all forms of cardiovascular disease can go up. Increase the risk of heart failure. Kilogram increases the risk of heart disease. So even that amount of kilogram can really push your weight up. And this is data from standard landmark trials like the UKPDS, the VADT, Advance and Accord. And you can see this, this is the weight that these people gained on insulin, on sulfonylurea, on glycoside, on rosiglitazone and gliburide. And you can see here, and it is estimated that for every 3 kg weight gain, you lose the benefit of getting your A1C down by 1%. So that's very important to keep in mind. Now this is data from UKPDS. And you can see here, patients were on sulfonylurea and hypoglycemia, and all risk of hypoglycemia increased. Now believe me, when your patients come back with hypoglycemia and weight gain, some of them who are loyal to you will come back, but there are patients who change their physicians because their drugs caused hypoglycemia. He will come and tell you that I was prescribed a drug and it caused severe hypoglycemia, and I, that's why I've come to you because I don't need a hypoglycemia in office. And these can really change the adherence to therapy. People will either decrease the dose of the therapy or will stop the therapy. And, and we all know that as you advance therapies from metformin to sulfonylurea to insulins, your risk of hypoglycemia may change and sometimes your people may start looking like this. Now what happens if you lose weight? Can, can something really help by losing weight? You can see just 5%, if you lose just 5%, you can prevent diabetes just by losing 5%. You can have better glycemic indices. You can have weight-related problems. Uh, you can decrease improvements in cardiovascular risk. Now, if you lose 10%, you will improve what you improved previously, but you will improve with sleep apnea, and you might even have remission of type 2 diabetes. And if you get more than 15%, you can reduce cardiovascular events, all-cause mortality. And this is data to show that the effect of moderate weight loss on all cardiometabolic uh, factors that you see, systolic, diastolic, blood pressure, triglycerides, cholesterol. So everything improves with this improvement in weight. So have we been able to unravel it? I think by therapies through the kidney, you can really unravel the KG A1C paradox. You can decrease A1C if you use the SGLT2 inhibitors. You can get a weight loss which decreases and you have less risk of hypoglycemia by using these agents because they have an insulin independent mechanism. Now here, here are your standard oral agents that you use every day. And what I've tried to do is show you on three important parameters, potent glycemic control, hypoglycemic risk and effect on weight. And you can see here metformin, no hypoglycemic risk, some weight loss because it cuts your appetite. Sulfonylureas un undoubtedly increase this. Glitazones increase weight. Alpha glucoside inhibitors are pretty silent. The DPP4 inhibitors give you a good control, no risk of hypoglycemia, but really no weight loss. With metformin, there are some studies which show that you might lose a kilogram or two. But if you have a SGLT2 inhibitor, you probably decrease this weight. You have a good control, no hypoglycemia. Now what is happening really? In type 2 diabetes, both the SGLT2 inhibitors, the SGLT2 protein receptors and the GLUT2 proteins are upregulated. So if you are a type 2 diabetic, both of them are up. You have more gluconeogenesis, increased glucose reabsorption from the kidney. And SGLT2 inhibitors are really novel agents. And they've been able to help us in a number of fashions. They work on an insulin independent mechanism. They lower both the renal threshold and decrease glucose reabsorption, provide robust and durable control, help in weight loss, no risk of hypoglycemia and you can combine them with any oral agent and they also have some pleiotropic effects like reduction of blood pressure. 
Now here is a study which combines. Now on your left you see HPA1C control. The the grey bar is sinagliptin, and the red bar is canag canagliflozin 300 milligram, and the blue bar is canagliflozin 100 milligrams. And you can see here about 70 percent patients are meeting HbA1c goals of 7.5. You can see here about 50 percent are meeting body weight reduction. But if you combine the two, you can see here as compared to a DPP4 inhibitor, almost 45 percent people are meeting both goals of weight reduction as well as HbA1c. And this is comparison to glimepiride. A glimepiride is still worse. You can see here this is citagliptin and this is glimepiride and you can see here about 75% people on 300 milligram and 72% people are meeting goals as far as body weight reduction is concerned and HbA1c reduction is concerned. And the important thing to realize is that the weight loss is really what you're losing is the fat mass and not the lean mass. And this study has been done with almost all the SGLT2 inhibitors which shows the reduction in the fat mass. Now what if you pushed your dose from 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams of canagliflozin? Now this is a study by Rosenstock and you can see here this is a very small study. 12 weeks published in Diabetes Care, 100 milligram of canagliflozin, HbA1c reduction is 0.76, body weight reduction is 2.6, fasting plasma glucose is 25. Another, this is citagliptin. They have about the same HbA1c reduction, but the body weight reduction is only 0.6. I'm showing you another study with EMPA, similar data here, 0.7, and only a mild weight gain. Now, let's see what happens if you give a 300 milligram of Canna. You get a 3.4 kilogram body weight loss both in both these studies here. And this is reflected also in studies here this is, these are not head-to-head -head studies. Mind you, I have written here very clearly. These are not head-to-head. But these, these studies were conducted in a similar fashion. 26 weeks, 24 weeks, 24 weeks. With all the three SGLT2 inhibitors, patients age about the same. Duration, six years of diabetes. And you can see here, 100 milligram gets you an HbA1c right here. But a 300 milligram is able to get you almost close to one here. This is diapagliflozin, but the least effective here is AMPA. So these two are pretty strong, and a 300 milligram canagliflozin is really powerful and better than the 100 milligram. Now, why is it happening? There is speculated that this works by two mechanisms. The renal, we all know, by increasing more glucose through the renal route, decreasing glucose reabsorption, but there is also a non-renal route it transiently inhibits the SGLT1 receptor. Now, what is SGLT1? SGLT1 is primarily located in the intestine and is responsible for the absorption of glucose and galactose. And if it partially inhibits that, it decreases postprandial excursions. There are also reports that it might increase GLP1 and other hormones which really push the blood sugars down. Now, does some other molecule have the same effect? I think the GLP ones also have an effect to really have the same effect on kilogram and A1C, and this is dulaglutide showing effect comparison versus all these molecules. You can see here a good HPA1C reduction and also a reduction of body weight. So both these molecules have been able to help us to really help. And if you look at the algorithms of the American Diabetes Association and the American Clen uh, College of Endocrinology, you can see here why these molecules have found their place. And this is because of the two important things that they are able to help lose weight and also prevent hypoglycemia. And if you were to combine the two agents, you might probably get better results in your patients. So ladies and gentlemen, we all have to remember that obesity is an important aspect when you treat diabetes, when you deal with people with diabetes. Your patients will put on weight as you intensify th therapy when you are using these standard regimens. And about 75% of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight. Weight gain is an issue with therapy, with intensive control. And weight management needs to be really controlled, really amplified. And I have shown you that all these molecules here 
do not help us, but SGLT2 inhibitors help us unravel this KGA1C paradox with their ability to decrease both A1C and kilograms. Now, if you were to compare a GLP-1 and a SGLT-2, the major advantage with the SGLT-2 is oral. So that, that's the major advantage. And now, if you use a CANA 300 milligram, you're getting results. Now, there was a network analysis which was uh, shown in the IDF 2015 at Vancouver, which no one orders presented. And they were able to show that liraglutide and CANA 300 almost had same results on A1C and the weight. So this, this is an insulin independent mechanism, which means it continues to work irrespective of your body basal uh, body residual insulin, whereas of course these therapies sometimes will require some effective functioning beta cells to work. And of course, cost is much more with the GLP-1s. So it's really important for us to choose therapies correctly and really decide which therapy your patients need. But it is important to realize that control of glycemia with management of weight and preventing the risk of hypoglycemia has really taken focus in our change of therapies in the last decade or so. Thank you very much for your attention. This is a question on weight reduction and its benefits. Suppose a patient is having 120 kilogram weight. Is he out of danger of cardiovascular diseases and complications of diabetes if the weight is reduced up to 15 percentage of the initial that. weight? I showed you that. Yeah. Even all cause mortality decreases. So even a 5 percent decrease really changes outcomes. A 10% decrease showed you even remission of diabetes and a 15% decrease reduced cardiovascular events and even all-cause mortality. So every kilogram is important. And believe me, only drugs are not going to work. Lifestyle intervention has to remain in focus when we are talking to our patients. They cannot go out of focus. That is the background on which all therapies are going to work. Absolutely. That's an excellent question and I use a lot of GLP-1s how with the SGLT2 inhibitors. What was your experience? That's excellent. I mean, I use a large, in, in a large number of people who have body mass indices of 32, 33, 34. Believe me, one therapy will not work. You will require multiple therapies. And as your body weight is going up, an injectable therapy has its role. Now, say when you get, when you don't get control of diabetes, you sometimes have to go on to insulin. And that's why the role of injectable therapies come in. Now, somebody who's markedly overweight, a powerful agent like a GLP-1 has to come in place. And that's why there are new studies going on where you combine a GLP-1 with a SGLT2 inhibitor. These are excellent combinations. Now, somebody who's got a body mass index of 27, 28, I would use a SGLT2 inhibitor with a DPP-4 inhibitor. And they, that also works beautifully. Instead of combining with a sulfonylurea, if my patient can afford, I will add a DPP-4 inhibitor to a SGLT2 or vice versa. If my patient was on a DPP-4, I'll add an SGLT-2 inhibitor. Just, just a last question. Okay, okay. Good talk, sir. Uh, Thank you. Just a question. I mean, in pre-diabetic with uh, obesity, would you recommend an SGLT-2? No, I don't think that's a recommendation at the moment. No, the it's not a recommendation, is, no, but no, I would, not, would you think there will be I would weight not, reduction? I would not use anything that's not recommended. I mean, that, that has to be, we have to have data before we start using it in pre-diabetes. I would in, intensify his lifestyle management and maybe use a metformin because now there are studies coming up, metformin can be used in pre-diabetes. So, what is the durability of the weight reduction in, in dulaglutide as well as in the SGLT2 inhibitor? Now, you see, the experience with the other GLP ones has been <coughs> better because they have been available for for people where I use exenatide. They were able to maintain that weight loss for four years, five years, but everything has to be with good lifestyle intervention. They should never think that they are using a GLP-1 and start eating everything. It has to be with lifestyle intervention. As far as the SGLT2 inhibitors are concerned, we have had experience for more than a year and I think they are maintaining that weight. That weight is right there, about 4 kilograms, 3.5, 4. And sometimes if you are using both of them together, I have had patients where in 6 months they have lost 6, 7 kilograms, 8 kilograms. But again, on the background of good lifestyle intervention, that cannot be disregarded by any chance. 
diet, exercise, metformin, then then everything else. You're right. Absolutely. You can't go without it. If there are no more questions, we will close this session. Thank you all. Thank you.